What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Virtual Band Director Conference. We have a real treat today, a real treat. We have the wonderful Mr. Eric Rath with us. He is a tremendous band director and a percussion pedagogue. And I'm thrilled for you guys to, to hear more from you or to hear more from him. So Mr. Eric Rath, take it away. Hey, John. Well, thanks for having me. This is really fun. I love seeing what you've been doing with this and rolling out content for educators to get um, just to like hone our craft and get better at. So I'm really excited to bring a little part of my expertise to those folks who are trying to get better at the percussion piece. Yeah, man. So we're doing beginner percussion pedagogy. And um, so you you have three main points. Am I right about like kind of what you're attacking today? Yeah. I, so probably the last five years, I get a lot of questions about, I get a lot of the same questions over and over about how do you do these certain aspects of percussion and uh, with specifically beginning percussion. And so when you invited me to do this, I started thinking about like, well, what do I talk about? And the thing that made the most sense was, well, what are the things that people always ask me about? So, um, you know, everything that I'm going to tell you today is stuff that I have stolen from really fantastic teachers. So the only fact that I'm sitting here is because I was smart enough to steal, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but um, man, I've, I've had some great conversations. I've been mentored by some incredible people. And then I have just found what kind of works in my situation. So I'm gonna just hit three things. And I don't know if it'll be super obvious that I'm looking at notes on my other screen, but I'm gonna hit um, three things that I get asked all the time. And these are, um, these are just seem to be universal questions that people have a lot about. So the first one, John, is um, how do I do my beginning percussion test? Because obviously, if you want to have a successful beginning percussion program, you really want to get the right kids placed on that instrument. So um, I think it's important before we get into all of the things that I'm going to talk about, just to bear in mind that these are things that work in my teaching con uh, context. And all of the great advice I've gotten over the years has not necessarily been like 100% immediately applicable to my teaching situation, but I've been able to kind of take things that work in the context of how we do things and, and roll with it. So um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell you what I do in my situation. And I bet it probably hits 90% of people right in about the same context. So the first thing is we are really fortunate that we do um, an instrument fair in Canyon and that's where students come up and they try out instruments and they're doing kind of a mass um, instrument placement and I get to be like in the circus sideshow with uh, percussion. It's usually in a different room. Our students come in um, they get selected on a wind instrument first and then if they're interested in trying percussion they come to me. Well one of the cool things about the instrument fair model is that parents have to bring their students to it. So we meet parents right away. And I love that um, about our system because we immediately get to be a face behind an email address. So parents come in, a lot of times, um, if I'm being honest, parents have maybe different expectations for their kid about what, what instrument they're gonna play. And a lot of times parents will be like, well, yeah, and you'd make a great percussionist because you drum on everything. Um, every, everybody I know drums on everything, so I don't know that that really uniquely qualifies anybody, but it's really good to meet the parent, to see, kind of get a feel for like the support and the relationship between the parent and the student, because you can pick up on so many like little background things, or you get a feel kind of for like maybe how confident the student is and how much the parent has um, just to do with that in terms of like the relationship. So you get to immediately see the family dynamic. Well, you know, meet the parent, it's also really interesting. Sometimes parents are more or less interested in going through the process. And so I kind of take mental notes about that. But I shake the student's hand. I look them in the eye. I introduce myself. It's, you know, natural for them to introduce themselves back to me. And I take a lot of mental notes on that because I want a student who, I mean, the handshake is one thing, right? I mean, my dad taught me to have a firm handshake. You know, not every 11-year-old knows that or, you know, they may be nervous. So I, I want them to feel like at least it's not awkward for them to shake my hand. And then I want them to make eye contact. There's a little bit of that aspect of if I'm getting eye contact from you now and I'm getting like this good kind of automatic, like, hey, we're going to start off on the right foot. Um, I feel like that 
kind of puts them in a class um, or like a, a tier where maybe they will be in the percussion class because they just kind of started by being personable and relatable and they made contact. And I, I have shy kids every year, so I don't mean to say that I'm only taking like these demonstrative assertive kids, but I want a kid who's confident, who's responsible. Um, I want kids who um, they handle instruction from me really well. A lot of times kids, when they come in with their parents, I'll ask them to do something and they'll kind of like turn and look at their parent for either approval or whatever. And I'm just always looking for that because I want a kid to be like, okay, now do this. And they go, okay. And they just do. So um, I also really talk to the parents and the kids about having, we want to place kids on the instrument who have a great um, natural and innate sense of rhythm already. And I talk to them about, well, this is important because you know, as percussionists really are in a language of rhythm that the rest of the band doesn't establish right away. So we have to find kids who are strong rhythmically and those make the best percussionists because I'm not having to try to bring them up to a, um, like a baseline of rhythmic vocabulary or rhythmic awareness. Mm -hmm. So we talk about those things. Um, I ask them if their room is clean. That's a Ken and Wiley thing. Um, he asks them if their room is clean, if they know where everything is, if they get their papers turned in on time, how their grades are. And he just wants to get, you know, that, that comment was he just wants to get a sense of like, kind of who is this kid. Um, so, you know, the, the, the room is the room clean. I always say if they're like, well, it's messy. And I'll be like, well, is it your brother's fault? And they're like, yeah, it's my brother's fault. I'll be like, okay. I mean, I had a brother growing up and he was always wrecking my room too. So I try to be really aware that sometimes a student might say, well, my room is really messy, but I know where everything is and I turn in all my papers. And so that doesn't phase me. Now, when it comes to getting into um, oh, one other point before I talk about the actual mechanics, one thing I try to make sure that I say to every student and I want their parent to hear is, and John, this is like, this hits me more as my own kids are getting into the band program because I not only see it as a teacher, but I see it as a parent. What does every parent want for their kids? Well, they want the best. And sometimes that means that things that are not expected are actually better for their kids. So one of the things I'll say is, um, you know, not every kid can be the quarterback on the football team but every kid has a different way that they can contribute. And so sometimes it's like, oh, I really wanna be a percussionist. Well, if it's not a good fit for you, I don't want you to be a percussionist because you're gonna get into my class and you're gonna be really frustrated because maybe you should be playing clarinet or you should be playing trombone. Mm -hmm. So we, we as a band staff really talk to parents about, we wanna find a good fit for your instrument and percussion is no different in that conversation. So I think the sports analogy works well with parents just because it's something that's fairly universal and a lot of parents, even if they went through a band, they understand those sports analogies. So first thing we do, um, just in the tangible part of the test, uh, I never put sticks in a kid's hands and I probably have to turn in my percussion cool, cool guy card for saying that. But the reality is um, <clears throat> I could teach a kid how to hold sticks and I can teach them how to move the sticks. So I'm not real super interested in seeing what a kid may already know because I don't want to spend a limited amount of time trying to correct them or trying to like show them. And then, you know, that that's not really what that's about. So for me, it's more about internal pulse interaction and kind of just like a, a, a already like a baseline of rhythmic awareness. So first thing I'll do is I'll turn on the metronome, usually around 90 beats a minute. And I just do these eight counts um, monkey see monkey do exercises and I have five of them and I always kind of like ride them out and, and then they do it and we kind of see how it goes. If I start there a lot of kids will pick up on the fact that it's jingle bells and this, those are easy rhythms and that's like okay er, nearly every kid's going to be successful on that. So that's a great place to start it's like oh hey that was really good and they're immediately getting feedback and praise from me so they're like okay this is you know, like this is a place where he wants me to succeed. I feel more comfortable. Um, you'd be surprised about five to 8% of kids will really have trouble with even that basic rhythm. So I'll do the rest of the test, but a lot of times on that first one, it's like, oh, the rest of this is not gonna go well. And then usually what happens is that's confirmed throughout the test. So I get a little bit harder. The second one, 
um, might have a little bit more space or like dotted quarter notes. The third one probably will start to introduce um, a little bit more in terms of syncopation. The fourth one will be like quarter notes, eighth notes, triplets and moving back and forth. So each line is getting more complex, but it's not physically difficult to do. And then the fifth one, I just try to write something that's kind of ridiculous and nobody really ever gets the fifth one. But if a kid ever does, I'm like, dude, no one gets the fifth one. You're awesome. You know, and usually the rest of the test, they're just like, can we start percussion today? You know, you found like that kid is going to be a four-year all-stater. So we do those five. If a kid, um, if a kid breaks down around two or three, that's totally cool. I'll just go on to the next portion of the test because I don't want that kid to feel frustrated. Um, they start to pick up on how well they're doing just from my cues. And also it's really important that the parents are seeing the test because the parents will be like, well, he plays drums at church and his older brother was a drummer. And so it's, you know, it's in the DNA and, you know, they have all these reasons their kids should be a percussionist. Well, if you do these basic rhythm clapping tests and the kid can't do it back, a lot of times the parent will be like, oh man, maybe my kid should play this other instrument that he fell in love with a few other minutes ago. So that's one of the great things about having the parents in the room. Um, when it comes to a kid not doing great on a particular line, I try to kind of telegraph that back to them. And, and here's what I mean. Like say they get stuck on the third one and you know they kind of have some trouble or they forget the rhythm. I'll say, okay, that's all right. Hey, that's all right. It, you know, these these get tricky. It's okay. And I want them to know, like, I recognize you're not super dialed in and you're not getting this right now. But I'm not like, no, that's not it. You're bad at this because I don't because I'm going to have a relationship with this student, whether they are in one of the classes that I teach or they come into the junior high program. So I want to make sure that even if the kid's not in percussion, they still feel like. Um, I treated them well, and even if they're not in my class, they're like excited maybe to have me as a teacher later in our cluster at some point. So I want them to always feel like what they're doing is not a you are bad as much as, okay, let's try again. This is tricky, and let's try to be as professional as possible. So we do those, and then the next thing is um, we do a coordination exercise. And so when I first started teaching, the song Clocks by Coldplay was popular but I still use that song, even though now the kids hear it and they're like, that's an oldie. Um, <laughs> but it's great because like the beat is really straightforward on it. It has an introduction with no drums. And I've kind of like figured out my spiel of what I say during that introduction. And then when the drums kick in, it's highly syncopated. And so I like to see if they can find the beat through that syncopation. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's clocks is that like that Bo Diddley, um, rhythm, mm, 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 mm. only, you know, slightly different uh, pulse um, or tempo. But one of the things I'll just have them do, so you have that, and I'll just have them do this with feet and with hands. And I'll say, okay, let's do it together. And I'm sitting across from them. Okay, now in a minute, the drums are going to come in and I'm going to stop, but I want you to keep going. So they're imitating me. Of course, I know where the beat is. And because they're imitating me, they're also doing the beat. But I say, okay, now when the drums come in, I just want you to keep going and I'm gonna stop, okay? But you keep going. And then the drums come in and I watch, are they as steady 100% as they were when I was? Or do they start to veer and move off the beat a little bit? Maybe the best thing about that song being an oldie is it's not gonna be a song a kid has like probably never heard before too. So that's also an advantage to see rhythmically how well they respond to that so then what I'll do is I'll just watch them for a while and I picked this up <clears throat> man I don't even remember where I picked this up but I would only let them go for like four or eight counts and then I'd change it up and now I'll go like 12 or 16 counts because a kid can get lucky four to eight counts mm, right. if they can just continue going 12 16 counts then you know they really have that pulse internalized so we'll do side to side hands and feet um the kids who are really, really good at this, I'll try to do stuff that's hard for me and see how they do. Um, but the thing that I always try to make sure if a kid's doing really, really well on this exercise, one thing I like to do is um, start asking them questions. So we'll do like, okay, let's do foot or like hand, hand, foot, foot, and they're all on quarter notes. And I don't do like crazy rhythms with this. It's more just about how they respond to me, the interaction, but also like the, the coordination and how confident they are. 
And so they're doing hand, hand, foot, foot. And I'll be like, all right, what's your middle name? And they'll be like, it's Cornelius or whatever. And if they're like quick to respond, I really take note of that because that means that their bandwidth, like their mental bandwidth is not ramped up all the way to a hundred. So I'll be like, okay, do you follow any sports teams? Yeah. Okay. Who do you follow? Oh, I love Texas Rangers. And if we're just having a conversation and they're staying in rhythm, dude, that kid's going to be in percussion class. <laughs> so, and what ends up happening is, you know, uh, probably 30% of the kids make the percussion class out of all the kids that I try out. So I learned, you know, I kind of always tailor this for a kid to feel comfortable with what they're doing. And if they don't get percussion, it should never be a blind side. They should never be like, what? That was amazing. So it should always be like, when we get done, it's like, hey, you know what? What was the instrument you got placed on? Saxophone? Okay, mom, I think that's a better fit for him. I don't think it is. And you know what? Almost 10 times out of 10, the mom is back there going, <laughs> like, she knows. The kid might be disappointed, and I get that. Um, but most of the time, they're like, yeah, no, okay, so honey, saxophone's going to be great. And then they're like, yeah, I tried it for percussion, but I didn't make it. And so I try to always make that a really environment for kids so that they don't feel like their first experience with band has any negative components to it um because i mean ultimately man the reason you and i do this is because we love music so right. we don't want to squash that on day one for a kid so that's how my test has um that's how my test has evolved over the years and the other thing is i, I used to i used to like write down who was going to make it and then i post it on the board later like hours later, and I realized that was incredibly inconvenient to parents to have to come back up later, or like their kid's pretty sure they're going to play clarinet, but they're going to wait and see, and so they can't, you know, they can't move forward, so I just go ahead and tell them right then, okay. and if I, I, very rarely do I have a parent challenge me, but every once in a while, they would be like, are you sure, and I'll be like, yeah, I'm sure, and I think that's one of those things, the longer I teach, the more I'm not scared to give bad news to a parent so if they're like well you don't think you will I'll be like well if you'd like me to repeat any part of the test I would be happy to do that but I'm just telling you like from 19 years of doing this this student would not typically be in the percussion class and I don't want your kid to be frustrated by that so they're like oh okay well you know usually logic prevails in that so that's the percussion test question for you any the percussion test stuff yeah um have you ever done it where you do like a two round audition or anything like that? Um, I have not. I mean, I know people who do. Um, I, I will say this, my disclaimer is, you know, I take 10 to 12 percussionists a year and we're just the right size that that's about the right percentage of kids. Um, I definitely miss on a couple of kids each year. They just have kind of inexplicably great tests. And then you're like, okay, awesome. And then they get into the class and they're either like, I, I mean, I just, they had a great class, a great test and you couldn't tell why. Um, or, and this is really probably more what happens, they get into it and they realize, oh, this is actually going to be work. And then they don't really rise up to that point. But I try to weed that out. I wonder from your question, is the two round thing to maybe be a fail safe for that? Yeah, that's that's normally where I've seen it put in place. Again, I haven't been a part of a program that does a two-round audition, um, but I've seen a number of band directors use it, and it's just come I, – I don't know if it's better or worse here or there. Um, yeah. I, I do know, obviously, everybody wants to play the drums. And yeah. <laughs> that two-round audition is to, to kind of help get some of that away, see if the kids are serious about it. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't certainly push back against that, but in our situation, it just makes sense to do everything in one round and not um, not try to drag that out. And, you know, the other part of it, too, is we're in a true team teaching environment where if the high school is doing something, all the directors are there and the middle school and the intermediate. So it may just be a matter of, like, this is our day. We have to make this count. Um, maybe if I was strictly a junior high teacher, I could do more of that, but we, you know, I chase the drum line on the same day I teach Johnny how to play his very first paradiddle. So I have to be very conscious of not um, getting my time out of hand. Right on. That makes sense. And so. Oh, I think I might have lost you there. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, I got you now. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Um, cool. 
are you ready for your next your next question yeah yeah okay i got i got my sticks here let's talk about grip and then let's talk about stroke because that's kind of i mean that's embouchure and that's air supply right um i teach i teach winds too in my my uh my every day so i always think grip is the embouchure and stroke is the air and so we we get i get a lot of questions about that and i think people really want to know like they want to make sure they don't set their kids up wrong with these fundamentals. So um, yeah, so the first thing I do, like day one stuff, is I have, I have students just drop their hands by their side. And what I want them to do is I want them to bring their hands up like they're like kind of mimicking a pantsing dog. And what they'll normally do is they'll bring their hands up, uh, palm down. Um, they don't usually ever bring it up like a, you know, a robot. Um, and, and I do it with them, so they model what I'm doing. And so they just, this is a relaxed hand situation. And then um, the next thing I have them do is I have them keep going and I have them watch what their fingers do, okay? So if they notice what happens, and I, I really think I'm doing this naturally. I mean, years of drumming, I don't think I'm like, make, you know, like kind of forcing this to happen. But if you'll notice, like just try it, John, try it with me. Right. If you'll notice the thumb and the index finger want to connect yeah. Yeah. You seeing that? Yeah. yeah. The thumb and the index finger want to connect. And what do the back three fingers do? They just relax into the hand. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So I, I mean, I remember discovering that one day, but I'm sure I'm not the first person to have that thought. So what I tell them is that um, there's nothing natural about holding a manufactured drumstick. That's not how, you know, the world was not made with trees and birds and streams and drumsticks, you know, this is kind of an unnatural thing. Playing the saxophone is unnatural too. But what we always do is try to bring a natural um, approach to what we're doing. So what I always try to show them is by doing that, we're seeing really two things form. We're seeing the thumb and the index finger connect and we're seeing the back three fingers. So there's two things happening on the hand and we're gonna exploit that as just a natural thing by a stick in there. Now there's a little bit more to it, but I always want them to realize that it's, um, it's just a natural, it's a natural part of being a human being. So um, then what I do is say, okay, to hold this stick, what we wanna do is make sure that the thumb and the index finger are directly across from each other. And what I do, and I, a little bit hard to show this, but what I do is I say, okay, if your thumb and index finger are in a straight line across from each other, we could take a nail or a screw and we could go straight in through your thumb, through the stick, and out the index finger. And that's great because sixth graders are like, oh, no, that hurts. Oh, don't do that. But I always say, okay, now I promise I won't do it, but do you see what I'm talking about? And they're like, okay, yeah, cool. And so they'll try that with me. And that's really the most important aspect of, of getting the grip right is getting the thumb and the index finger to be placed in exactly. Are you, you're getting your sticks out? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Gonna, they're going to. We're gonna get our hands dirty today. This is great. <laughs> um, so really the most important thing is getting that thumb and that index finger across from each other because if it's not set that way, they won't have true control of the grip. And I always kind of talk about like, this is the steering wheel. If this doesn't happen, you don't have control of the car, you know? So they have to make sure that that's happening first. And then the cool thing is, and you go back to this with the hand kind of collapsing in on itself mm -hmm. is, the back three fingers just they just come to the stick and so what i always talk to them about is not like gripping with the back three fingers but they're just placed there they are there to help support the weight of the hand okay you want to do it together all right yeah. put your hand down all right okay cool all right raise your hand up and then keep going you feel that natural curve yep thumb and index finger want to join back yep. three fingers kind of separate part okay cool so now put your thumb across from your index finger. Yeah, your thumb is at an angle. We want it to be more like it's pointing down towards the bead of the stick. Now, my really good friend, the newly elected president of the team EA, John Carroll, he always has his students do this first, where they just put their thumb inside the pocket of their index finger. And he says, it's like, it's like your hand was designed for your thumb to have a place to go. And then he talks about putting the stick in between it 
and then drilling a hole through it. That's yeah. all, that's all John Carroll stuff, but yeah, it totally works. Um, one thing I forgot to put in my notes, and this is really important, is where do you place your thumb and your index finger? So I learned this from a, uh, from a buddy who marched uh, snare line and blue nights. And he said they would take them back to basics and start with like, this is how you hold a stick. Kind of that John Wooden college basketball, like this is a basketball and we're going to teach these, you know, 19 year old men how to tie their shoes. So what they would do is they would say, okay, imagine that you were going to cut your drumstick into thirds. Where would you put your finger scissors? And so kids are kind of trying to figure out where those balance points are. Mm -hmm. And I just quickly refer to this in my class as one thirds, two thirds, it's because what we do is that lower third is where the thumb and the index finger should go. And then what they have is one thirds, two thirds. So it's a really quick way that I use in my class mm -hmm. to tell a student, hey, you're one thirds, two thirds, and then they'll go back through and they'll check. And I'll always say, okay, where you're placed, one thirds, two thirds, not only is it a good frame of reference for where to start, but as you play, when you accidentally veer away from that spot, you'll start to feel that balance point has shifted out of balance. So oh. it gets them started with a visual, but then when they start playing, if they get too far down the stick or they're too far back, they'll feel the balance change. And so it's a quick way to get them there, but then like eventually the feel of the, of the stick will take over at that point. So um, I put all of that into, oh, um, let me make sure that I, I say this real quick. I don't use the word fulcrum very much um, at first because, and I don't know if this is controversial, but this is how <laughs> I teach my class. Um, I say, okay, when I play, everybody says the fulcrum right, is right here. You're right, that is where the fulcrum is. The problem is I'm going to have my students start with wrist strokes and they, they will think the fulcrum is here. And you know what? It is because isn't the fulcrum the place where the pivot happens? Yeah, it is. Why do we call this the fulcrum? Well, when my fingers get active, the stick is pivoting here, but the stick can pivot here. It can pivot here. It can awkwardly pivot here and you know, quintuple fortissimo at the end of the marching show, it can pivot right there too. So I try to not talk about this as being the fulcrum early on, because a lot of times 11 year olds have learned the basics of like balance and fulcrum. And I don't want them to get caught up in thinking that this is the, the only place where the stick might pivot. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. And so that we have a little saying in my class. Um, I, I coach them to repeat, like not repeat, but like finish my sentence. So I'll say thumbs are, and then they learn to say flat. And so that's referring to the thumb being flat against the stick. And I'll say hands are flat, or hands are, and they'll yell back flat. And that means that their palm of their hand is face down. And that this is basically just um, parallel to the ground. I usually go buy a couple packages of Oreos in the first couple of weeks of school. And I'll walk around and I'll put Oreos on their hands. And I'll be like, okay, is the Oreo staying? And they'll be like, yeah. I'll be like, what happens when you start playing? Well, it'll fall off. Okay, well, yes, but if it's there to start, you know, that at least gets them in a good preparatory place. So we always talk about their cookies or their Oreos, but yeah, thumbs are flat, hands are flat, fingers are wrapped around the stick, which is trying to eliminate, what's <laughs> up? I got a helper, which is trying to eliminate like flying the pinky or the back three fingers off of the stick. Um, and then everything, and I say should feel, and they just say relaxed. Okay. I guess they're going to go fill up water jugs. <laughs> All right. This is the nature of distance learning, right? Yeah, you could be a CEO of Fortune 500 um, uh, company, but then, you know, a kid might come in and need more milk in a sippy cup, and then you're just dead. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So our little saying is thumbs are flat, hands are flat, fingers are wrapped around the stick, and it should feel relaxed. And they chant that back to me. So it's something that they always are thinking about. And it's a, just a quick way to go through those checkpoints. Um, okay, so the other thing that, you know, the next part, we've set the embouchure. Now let's talk about the air supply or the stroke. Um, I will just say, if anybody wants, infer <sighs> okay, I'm just gonna say this real quickly. I, th I think everything should be labeled um, in the percussionist's bag, stick bag, 
every part of their uh, snare stand, their pad should all be labeled. Oftentimes what I'll do is I'll also put a piece of tape right there, like a little piece of electrical tape, and they know that if they get up onto that tape, they've gone too far. So that's just, I mean, one thing I just want to make sure I don't kind of, maybe it doesn't necessarily fit perfectly into everything else we've talked about, but it's such a great little tool. Um, Kyle Lutz, who teaches in Indiana, wrote a really great article on Band Directors Talk Shop about just having tape for like all these little different checkpoints. It's mm -hmm. great. So if your um, audience wants to check that out, they'll learn a lot from that article on Band Directors Talk Shop. So what we do is um, we, we kind of start the same way. And I'm going to tilt down a little bit for this. See, bud. <laughs> All right. See my pad here. So we'll start away from the practice pad. And I'm sitting down, but I, I'd back up. And then I'll tell them to bring their sticks up. Whoops. Bring their sticks up and make the letter A. You know, A without a crossbar, right? Um, and what I'm looking for, and it's not going to be perfect here because where I'm sitting, where I'm sitting to try to get the pad and the camera view, it's not going to be perfect. But what I'm looking for is them to just bring their sticks up to a normal, relaxed height. And you really want to watch the shoulders so that the shoulders don't jump up. Okay. Um, so this is really important to me. Every kid's built a little bit different with their proportion. So I don't, I don't try to set things based off of those old descriptions of like, line it up with your belly button or five inches below or in line with your belt buckle because that might have worked for somebody once, but it probably is a bad idea to set every kid that exact same way. So what I want to do is go back and just see where they naturally set their hands. And, you know, you can get a feel for whether they're a little bit high or low. And then what I tell them is I tell them to walk up to their pad. And then if their sticks just hover over their pad, the height is just right. But if they had to bring their sticks up a little bit, you know, that that's something that you would just adjust the height of the pad. And um, then once you find that place on their pad, you tape that part of the stand. So when it's time for them to set up tomorrow, they just go to that piece of tape and it cuts the it cuts it down really fast. And the great thing about a piece of tape is you can remove it if you got it wrong and replace it or just put a new piece of tape on. So um, uh, that's kind of what I do. I watch the shoulders really carefully and make the letter A. And then I'm not sure, I mean, I know I came up with this, but I'm not, I can't be the only one. We talk about our sticks being the elevators of a hotel. And they're like right in the center of the hotel and they travel up and down. And now they're down here in the lobby and they go up to the 12th floor. It's not a fancy hotel. It only has 12, 12 stories. That's not the Grand Hyatt, San Antonio. And so what we do is we talk about the sticks, basically go through this straight path up and down. And sometimes we want to go to the third floor. Sometimes we're going to go to the sixth floor, ninth floor, 12th floor. And honestly, I think probably part of that had to do with the fact that I start those kids in sixth grade, but I also teach them on the drum line at high school where the height thing is really important. So if I can kind of pre-teach them that, then by the time they get into high school, maybe it's not a foreign concept or something new they have to learn. So we talk about it being at 12 possible stories, and that's going to be the whole path of the stick. Now this might look a little bit weird with the angle and with me sitting down. So if it looks a little bit funny, it isn't normally when I play. And we just talk a little bit about bouncing a basketball or like, have you ever seen anybody bungee jump and they jump down and the, you know, they get snapped back up. But really the basketball analogy is so good. And uh, Canyon, Texas is known for great girls basketball. So there's like a, a definite basketball culture here. But we just talk about it being just like throwing a basketball down. When you bounce a good basketball that's properly inflated, um, you know, you're only doing about half of the work. So I try to equate that with, you know, you're just putting the stick in motion, but when it hits, a good pad or a good drum is going to push it back up. And so your hand is throwing it into motion, but when it wants to naturally rebound, your hand is just following it as part of that. Okay. So we just spend a lot of time just doing just relaxed rebounding legato strokes. And this is a place where, you know, you kind of talk about, okay, what's, what's pivoting? Well, it's the wrist. And you will generally see kids who try to open and close the hand. And so what I tell them is the fingers are not, they don't have an active role right now, but it's kind of like the SWAT team at the police department. Like there's a SWAT team and they're ready to roll when it's time. 
but that, you know, like nobody shows up to work dressed, dressed out for SWAT. You know, that's a special circumstance. So that's a situation where most of the time they're just moving the wrist and not using their fingers actively. We just tell them it's just a, a passive support of the weight of the stick. They have a job and their job is to help out, but their job is not to move. Um, and I tell them, at least for a little while, if they drop their sticks, <clears throat> it's okay because I don't want them to death grip the sticks. Um, now, a lot of teachers are like real anti-dropping sticks. And I am too. <coughs> I promise I'm not emotional about this. I just got choked <laughs> up. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe I am emotional about this. But um, <clears throat> a lot of teachers get like really into this militant, like if you drop your stick, your last chair. I do eventually adopt that. <clears throat> but I don't adopt it at first because I want students to feel like they can be relaxed. And if they drop a stick, it's kind of already embarrassing. So it's the sort of thing they'll want to avoid, but they know from me, no punishment. Um, I'm very blessed to have a, uh, have a chair in the uh, Amarillo Symphony. So a lot of times I talk about, you know, I'm kind of like the completed version of you. And I'll talk about like, I started in sixth grade like you did, only I had like, I had terrible teachers, not terrible teacher, I just had a bad band situation, but I always say like, now, is it okay for me to drop a stick in symphony? And they'll be like, no, that'd be really embarrassing. And so I always say like, yeah, you're right. And I've never done it. <clears throat> and I don't worry about it happening because eventually I got to a point where I, I gained control over what I was doing, but didn't become super tense where that causes problems for me. I'm not gonna lie. I've caught a stick a couple of times like this in symphony, but I didn't <laughs> drop it. I just lost it for a second or whatever. Um, <clears throat> usually when I'm switching instruments. But um, yeah, then eventually like six weeks in, I tell them the story and I don't wanna embarrass anybody. So I won't tell you who this was, but there was a TMEA honor band probably 16, 17 years ago. And it was a junior high band <clears throat> and they were incredible. I mean, it was like early part of my career. And I was just like, I didn't know that seventh and eighth graders could play like this. And they were just, I mean, they were just killing it. And they were playing some great closer. It wasn't Stars and Stripes Forever, but it was something where it was like, um, they, I mean, they were, it's just like their entire concert had been amazing. And then their last selection was like, they just turned it up to 11, poured <laughs> gas on the fire. It was amazing. And um, everybody was basically up out of their seats for the, for the ovation at the end of the last note. It's something that everybody knew. So I mean, everybody kind of knew it was coming to an end. And uh, a kid dropped his stick oh. on the last note. And um, it was like in that, it was in that like little crevice of time, right as the last note ends before people start clapping. And it kind of like, it totally killed the reception because you could hear audible like, oh, kind of, you know, that sort of thing. So I tell them the story. And I, you know, I always say like, you know, do you think that kid is a good player? Well, yeah. It's like, do you think that kid was embarrassed? Well, yeah. Do you think that took away from the performance? Well, yeah. So I always say it's like, it's safe to drop a stick, but then they eventually want to work themselves out of that. This is kind of unrelated, but the only other time that I'm like, okay with them dropping a stick is when we start learning how to double stroke, because then they have to start working the new combination set of skills and muscles. And so if they're doing that and they drop, I'll always be like, hey, it's okay. You're learning to do like double bouncing. And so it's, it's normal to try to experiment and feel around and try to get used to a new technique. So yeah, man, that's the stroke. And that's the story. <laughs> I could tell you who it is, but I mean, it wasn't, it, it was yeah. unfortunate, but it was a fantastic concert, but it makes for a great uh, illustration these days. Absolutely. Gosh, don't yeah. tell us who it is, though. Don't do it. No, no, no. Do it. no they, know. they know who they are. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you talked a little bit about, like, with the strokes and per particularly you know, uh, pertaining to snare drum, um, but how do we go into, like, keyboard world? How does that work for you? Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked. So one thing I've neglected to mention is I start with the stick up, and I let them figure out how to drop the stick and bring it back up. Um, my very, very good colleague and, and writing partner, Ralph Hicks, teaches the opposite. 
it's funny that he and I have become so close and have become these, you know, prolific um, writing partners because there's so many like little things, ticky tacky things that we disagree on. Um, but, it, but it always makes you think about why you do what you do. So he's a real big lift and play guy. And I totally see the merit in that. But the reason that I'm a, um, a piston stroke, it's really kind of borrowed from a keyboard technique. I'm a piston stroke guy because I want that rebound to just be the first thing that they do instead of having to factor in the lift first. And of course, Ralph, if he was here, he would just be like, yeah, but it's just one more thing the kid does. And so literally different strokes for different folks, but no, you know, no big deal. Um, part of the reason that's important to me is I, I also have my students do this on keyboard. And so <clears throat> all of the things with grip, one thirds, two thirds, generally works on every stick and mallet with maybe minor adjustments. Um, I don't teach timpani until the second year. And one of the things we talk about is that one thirds, two thirds still works on timpani mallets, but you know, the mallet tends to be a little bit shorter. And so the proportion feels different, but the placement is generally the same idea. But yeah, we just put xylophone mallets in their hands and then I just teach them, okay, here's G, find it, hit it. They, they sometimes miss, that's okay. But because we've talked about that pathway of the elevator going straight up and down, kids are um, surprisingly more accurate learning how to do that with xylophone than you might think. You might think, um, well, you know, they need to start close to the note and then depart from it and hit. But the reality is on xylophone, if you're not careful to get your mallets up out of the keyboard, you run the risk of your mallets hitting each other. And there's so much lateral movement involved in keyboard playing that if a student hovers over the keyboard, um, they, there's a really good chance they don't free up their motions to move laterally over the keyboard. So even when they play like soft dynamics, I still wanted to have kind of that piston stroke approach. Um, what I tell them, the big principal difference, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's a pitched instrument and it has theory, more, you know, linear theory with note names. So they have more to worry about there. Um, but the other thing I tell them is, you know, what's the big difference when you hit a xylophone for the first time and your stick doesn't come back up because the xylophone's not bouncy. And I, <clears throat> I have my students play on a classroom set of xylophones, but the instrument that I have them get for at home is a uh, practice xylophone. So they are playing on the bounciest of the percussion keyboards anyways, and it just doesn't have that much bounce. So what I tell them is, if we start here, we play the note. Well, the mallet won't want to come up on its own, but we know from drums, from uh, snare drum, from snare pad, that we want to accompany what would essentially be a bounce. So now we know what that would look like and feel like on snare pad, we want to apply that to keyboard percussion. And it just means that we have a little bit more work to do physically, but it's not awful. And I don't start keyboard right away. And this is maybe the biggest question I get asked is, when do you start keyboard? Um, and everybody expects the answer to be, oh, just as quick as you can. And I'm like, I, I push it off. I hold off for such a long time. Um, but yeah, I, I want them to be so comfortable with moving the stick that when they get to xylophone, it's just innate. They just kind of know what it's supposed to be. And we just acknowledge the fact that it's not a bouncing instrument. So yeah, grip, stroke, um, kind of the legato stroke sort of concept, we, we move that over to xylophone too. Now with your kids, do you do, and I might be jumping ahead, I hope I'm not getting too far ahead <laughs> of you, but do you do a snare and xylophone on the same day? Like, do you mix it up? Um, like when you're teaching the sixth graders? Um, yeah, let me give you like a breakdown. So when we start with our first day of playing in class, we are gonna go probably no less than about 10 weeks on just snare. Um, we, we have our semesters broken up into six weeks um, increments. There are a lot of times, and, it, and honestly, sometimes the marching band component of my job affects things based kind of, you know, cause you're thinking more seasonally there. Um, so a lot of times I'll go like 12 weeks before I go to keyboard. Um, and, and here's why. I want to make sure that the snare drumming is the foundation of what we do um, and that we don't try to convolute the class or like the, the expectation, the academic expectation 
by throwing in too much extra weight too soon. So I really, really want students to have a great legato stroke, to have a really pretty varied rhythmic vocabulary, um, which would be, you know, all the white notes into quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, maybe even some three note, sixteenth note variations. Should be very uh, dotted rhythms. I want them to really know a lot of that before we go to keyboard because you're adding this additional layer of rigor, which they know is coming, of course, but you don't want it to be the sort of thing that kind of muddies the snare water. So we'll go 10 or 12 weeks, and I don't have a hard and fast rule on that because, um, especially at the end of the year, I just let the class organically work through the year, especially in the fall. Um, I'll introduce keyboard, and they know the last, that third six weeks before Christmas break, they're going to get a lot of xylophone. And then we come back in the spring, and I kind of ramp up the intensity a little bit, but I'm not having to do procedures as much. I'm not having to talk about all the basics except for just quick reminders. So in the fall, I just try to be nice and easy, let the class kind of dictate the pace. And then in the spring, I turn up the heat and I push them to go a little bit faster. So um, the first time we touch xylophone, we will do at minimum a week on just xylophone. So we'll do, you know, five class periods where we just come in and it's like, here's everything you wanted to know about getting started on a xylophone. And we get into the basic reading and that way they don't also have to like, like think about managing snare back. But once that introductory period is over and sometimes I've gone two weeks, again, just kind of feeling the pacing of the class naturally. Um, really quick classes will just be like, yeah, cool, we got it. Can we start going 50-50? Um, then what we do is we start every day in class on xylophone. I have a 40 minute class every day. Um, so we do 2020, we do 20 minutes on xylophone, and then we shift over to snare. And we try to do both every day because both are important. And I don't ever want to signal to a student that like snare is more important or keyboard is more important by dwelling so much on one that it sends the signal that like, yeah, this other thing is important, but this is important or, you know, I, don't, I never want to send that signal. Um, but I think they understand the mechanics of starting snare is to get just that foundation of reading rhythms, understanding expectations, behavior, um, logistics, playing, all of that. So that's how we manage it. Uh, there are the occasional times that will be really hot and heavy on xylophone and we just won't get to snare. And I try not to be so legalistic about switching that if there's a day where we're like either totally blowing something and we need lots of remediation or we're just like, we're cruising and it's like, oh, I don't wanna shift the momentum. Let's just keep going on this. And usually the students understand, but that's just, you know, an occasional sort of thing. Um, but yeah, once we get started, we try to go half and half every day. And um, that keeps us moving along and not worrying about stalling out on either of the instruments. He's not and just a pedagogue, fun. he's a genius, folks. <laughs> I have no, I don't know about that. I have five kids too, so I haven't slept in about 14 years. So, yeah. I, I, it's funny, we go to church with people who are, they're just starting to have kids. We're kind of, it's weird, we're in an older demographic, but I remember when we had our third child, everybody was like, yay, congratulations. And then when we announced that my wife was going to have our fourth, they're like, okay, that's a little weird, you know? <laughs> so, but the, the younger families in our church, um, one of our uh, pastors, uh, they had their fourth um, a few months ago, and when they announced that they were going to have their fourth, I texted them and I said, "Hey, congratulations! Now you're weird." So <laughs> it's just something about you know once you get past about three kids, people are like, "Okay, what's wrong with you?" You know, like yeah. So yeah, there's there's not a lot of sleep happening at my house right now, but it's all good. I yeah. can only imagine. <laughs> now, are did you want to go on, or did you want me to start asking you some questions that we have here? Yeah, we can take questions. It's great. All right, cool. Uh, so kind of going back to the drum, like snare drum, how do you teach roles? How do you approach teaching roles? Oh, yeah, this is a great question. Um, this is honestly probably a separate Zoom meeting because of how big the question is. Um, there are two roles that I'm trying to make sure students are fairly proficient or competent at when they finished sixth grade and this year notwithstanding, we had just barely started. Uh, we had, you know, kind of done a big unit on double strokes and kids were having 
you know, very varied success on that. We just barely started uh, buzz rolls by mm -hmm. spring break. So I did a lot of like buzz roll videos and put them in Google Classroom. And every once in a while, they'll send me a playing assignment for buzz rolls. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, we'll fix that in seventh grade. You know, I was just, you just can't, you know, you can't make a living out of doing this online. But yeah, it's fun. Um, so, okay, I always start with double strokes. And um, the, another question that I get asked a lot, John, is like, what, what method book I use. And the reality is eventually one of these days, I'm going to finish the method book that I'm writing. So I've had students playing out of my stuff for several years as I'm kind of like tweaking it and getting things where I want it. And then I would eventually like to put my own out. But the big two that are out is um, the Wessels book and the Wiley book. And then Frank Chambers has a great book that's like an all encompassing percussion curriculum. And Michael Hustis has a book um, similar. It's, it's about playing musically, I believe. I'm not personally familiar with it. But the reality is, whatever book you pick, you know, you just have to let the book do its job and you have to really buy into it. So um, here's what I chose. And I can't, I taught both Wiley and Wessels. And I love aspects of both. I'm, I'm not writing mine because I'm suddenly right. I'm just taking a different pathway. They're, they're both great books. Um, here's what you're trying to do. And I teach double strokes first. So what you're trying to do is now you're trying to unlock the fingers. Like we talked about before, like this is coming the day when the fingers finally get their chance to be involved. So what I do before I actually teach double stroke rolls is I teach what I call the roll primer. And I don't have it in front of me, but it's something like this. Uh, let me slow it down. check pattern and then a variation and I go through about nine different variations of eighth note check pattern and then 16th note variation all teaching students how to do double strokes and so um, in the midst of learning other things leading up to double strokes I start adding this roll primer we do it at slow tempos and it's essentially a way for them to learn what is going to become double strokes without it being like today, double strokes, you know, and you don't want it to be like this sudden revelation that there's this new technique. It's really, um, I wish I could show uh, clips of the Karate Kid in my class, but I finally went back and watched some of it, and I didn't realize how bad the profanity is in it. I mean, it's not Quentin Tarantino bad, but I would not feel comfortable showing 11-year-olds clips of um, Ralph Macchio talking to Mr. Miyagi like that. He's a national treasure. Nobody talks to Mr. Miyagi like that. But I always kind of explain, there's one scene that you can show and it doesn't have terrible language. And it's the one where, you know, Ralph Macchio has done, uh, was Daniel's son, right? He's yeah. done all the painting, and he's done all the waxing and everything. And he finally gets really mad at Mr. Miyagi. And then he says, you're having me do all these chores around the house. When are you going to teach me karate? And then Mr. Miyagi basically explains that, well, you've been, you've been building all this muscle memory. So he throws a punch and he says, wax on. And he throws a punch and, you know, Daniel son blocks it. Yeah. So that's my approach to double strokes is we're going to learn these motions and we're going to turn up the heat and the tempo on them little by little to when it's time to go to double strokes. It's like, look, if you needed to go faster on this exercise, how would you do that? Because they're going to get to a point where that's really hard for a sixth grader to play wrist strokes on everything. So I want to be really clear when they're, when we're doing this roll primer exercise slow, um, they're, they're wristing everything. It is standard legato strokes. And as we go faster, they reach a point where they have a breaking point. And what I want to do then is say, okay, now, if we go faster, here's the solution. And more savvy kids, they start to pick up on, okay, I can see where this is going. But once we get to a certain point, and I wish I had it in front of me, there's usually like this area of tempos on this exercise where kids really start to have difficulty going faster. Then we start talking about getting two for one by allowing the stick to bounce um, twice. Now, I take a little bit of a buzz roll approach and that is, okay, um, just let the stick drop and don't, don't worry about bringing it back up. And so we do that a lot. And this is one of those times where sometimes the students will go back to dropping sticks a little bit and it's like, hey, it's okay. You know, we're trying to experiment and feel this. So drop the stick. And I'll always say, 
the first note is really predominant. Yes. Did you notice that the second note also has a pretty solid um, lifetime before it kind of just devolves into z like the buzz sound? So you can hear one, two, three pretty prominent strokes as you do that. And then I'll say, okay, now just try to drop after or try to stop after two. Now they're not doing anything with their back fingers. And this is all on purpose, all sequenced out. So, okay, stop after two. And I'll say, okay, which note is louder? The first or the second? The first. Why is the second one not as loud? Because it's lower. Okay, good. Now, how could we get the second note to be as loud as the first? And we take tons of wrong answers and I'll have kids who be like, oh, me, 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 I know, I know how to. And they'll do really crazy stuff. And I'll be like, oh, okay, yeah. Hey, did that work? And they're like, no. <laughs> and um, so what we try to do is I say, okay, now remember how your back three fingers haven't had an active role yet. Oh yeah. Okay, well now they're gonna actually kind of pop that second note so that it has more equal to the first note. Now, this is a crock pot. This is a slow burn. This is something that um, students take a long time to progress and it is directly related to how much time they put on it at home. So I really preach you have to do this exercise at home all the time. But I try not to freak out if a student doesn't have good double stroke rolls for a while. And to be completely honest, because of our team teaching situation, I start sixth graders and I teach them through their senior year in high school. So a lot of times I don't see their sixth grade year as being this unit of instruction. I see it as being like the introduction because in seventh and eighth grade, I have, um, I see those kids, I see every percussionist grade six through 12 every day. Um, I know that's not the case in every environment. And so I don't mean to say that that's somehow, you know, better than somebody else's situation. But there are a lot of times like on double strokes, if a kid doesn't get it, just like really dialed in in sixth grade, I go, okay, we'll come, we'll come back after the summer. We'll pick right up where we left off and we just keep going. And that's one of the ways that I keep seventh and eighth graders engaged is we don't ever really get out of percussion class. We don't graduate percussion class. We're always kind of consistently doing it um, sometimes in seventh and eighth grade on an almost regular basis. I have a lot of freedom in my job to take percussionists out as much as I want. So it's almost like they get three years of beginning percussion. But back to the mechanics of the stroke, yeah. What they're learning to do is activate the SWAT team by getting those back three fingers to snap. And then eventually that can, can go a little bit faster. Oh man, I've got quarantine hands, you can hear it. Um, but it can go a little bit faster because they start to manipulate how the back three fingers work. So the things that I always tell them is, you know, you have to be pretty liberal with your bounce and you have to activate your fingers. And the truth is, there's not a whole lot more I can say about how to do it. They have to, like they have to take it upon themselves to do it. And so there are a lot of things and I'll say like, hey, I feel like I do a pretty good job teaching you guys, but like if you don't go home and work on this, it's never gonna happen. So there's no way that I can like lecture them into that skill, if that makes sense. And then the cool thing about, well, the thing about doing double strokes is, I feel like that's the one that's the one stroke between uh, doubles and buzzes that gets the most return on investment, even though they may not play a lot of open bull stroke rudiments until they get to like high school battery playing. But to me, it's the one that requires so much refinement that it's a lot, it's a lot easier to me to take the step of like opening and whipping the stick with the back fingers so if they really work through that, when it's time to talk about buzz rolls and the back three fingers are supportive, but they're not as active, it's like suddenly easier to do. So it's a little bit like putting on extra weights and then the next skill does not require as much weight. And so the lifting is a lot, it's a lot easier for the student. I do. And one thing that I wanna just make sure we're super clear for our audience on is when Eric's talking about team teaching, that means the people in his clusters, so, or not necessarily, it could be your cluster, um, but the, the intermediate, the junior high, and the high school use all of the staff to teach 
uh, beginning instruments and help each other out. So, you know, like in my situation, I teach all of the brass instruments. That wouldn't happen in a team teaching situation because right. somebody else would come in to teach, you know, French horn or tuba or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so, and we've, we've kind of been hitting on this a lot in our, in our conferences here, but the more help you can get on your campus, the more adult, educated, trained bodies you can get to help your kids, the better off it can be. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a great situation up there in Kenya. Yeah. All right. Uh, ooh, this is a big one. So what do you recommend for the progression of teaching rudiments? Um, okay, so yeah, that is a big one. Um, so <clears throat> I referenced earlier that I'm working through writing my own curriculum for beginning percussion. And I, in the process of setting that up, kind of created a rubric of when I wanted to introduce what concepts. Um, so let's just remove the word rudiment from the discussion for a minute. I think well, okay, but actually, let's tackle it for a second. <laughs> I, th I think non-percussionists see rudiments as, oh, man. Okay, I just go ahead and call the Percussive Arts Society now and send back my membership card. <laughs> um, but I think sometimes non-percussionists see rudiments as being far more important than percussionists do. And I think that, I mean, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but uh, man, this is, this is messy alligator infested waters, but I just think there are a lot of people who teach so many rudiments that they are chasing 40 rudiments. And the reality is in common musical applications, their students are going to see like 20 of them. So do I believe in rudiments? Yes, I believe there is a Santa Claus and I believe in rudiments, but I also don't want to get so like bought into the teaching of that, that I can't teach the percussionist to be the entire uh, percussionist. And, you know, you referenced earlier all, all the books and things that, um, that I have out. You know, Ralph Hicks and I believe really strongly about kids don't join percussion to be a snare drummer. They join to be a percussionist. So, you know, that's a lot of our stuff is kind of like making sure that we're teaching the whole student. And if you chase percussion, if you chase rudiments too much, then what ends up happening is you can forget and neglect other aspects of the teaching that's so important. So when I talk about sequencing, rudiments are a part of it, but rudiments are not like the diet of the sequencing. So the main thing is getting a really great legato stroke, as we've talked about already. And this is really um, a Ken and Wiley thing. His book does a really long set of lessons, almost like 10 lessons, where the only technique that you use is just legato strokes. I have seen that be just absolutely wonderful for students because they're working on one thing, they're perfecting the stroke that's used for most of our playing, but then in the process of learning how to do it, they're learning a ton of different rhythms they're learning a ton of different like music theory items with that. And um, they're also learning, you know, you can play a fair amount of dynamics with legato strokes before you have to do like crazy, like forte piano um, stick shifting things. So um, rudimentally in the first unit of the stuff that I do, I don't even know that I really technically get into a rudiment except maybe single alternating strokes, but that there again is not really the intent behind that particular rudiment. Um, when we get into our second unit and we start doing like, okay, now the stick does not bounce because it, you know downstrokes are a real thing and you need to know how to do it. Once you start learning the change of dynamic and the presence of accents, you know, downstrokes and upstrokes are how you build flams but you can't build a flam without legato strokes. So there's a little bit of getting the cart before the horse when it comes to rudimental teaching. So yeah, first unit in my materials, all legato strokes, then it shifts over to down strokes, I'm sorry, down strokes, taps, up strokes, and full strokes. And they learn that the legato stroke that they have been using this whole time also has another name and that's a full stroke. And then they learn how to not let the stick bounce. And then they, you know, they learn to bring the stick up. And so they learn four stick types and they already know one of them. And then from there, 
we start to get into the roll primer and that's obviously a rudiment. And the thing is, once a kid can do this, teaching them a five, seven, nine, 11, 13 stroke roll, it's just a matter of turning the faucet on and then turning it off at the right time and them understanding the math behind how many strokes and you know, why is it a five stroke roll if you double bounce four times? You know, it's because you count the last note, you count the release of the roll. So when you take this approach and you don't, and you don't look at it as teaching these little rudimental things, if you teach it as a skill, here's a double stroke roll, then just chopping it up, it, it, you know, suddenly a kid's gonna walk out of class after two weeks of playing double stroke rolls and then they suddenly are like, oh, I can play eight rudiments. Or, you know, I'm just spitballing, but you know, that's one of those things where you try to, I don't know, rudiments are, are milestones, but rudiments are not curriculum. So uh, then the next thing I do after that, we get into a lot of um, accented 16th notes and moving the accents around. And that's also going, you know, flams have accents built into them. So you're developing kind of some of that um, introductory uh, verbiage that's going to build flams, not only with full down tap and up strokes, but also with understanding how accents affect um, affect what's happening. And once you can play flams, you know, once you have an idea of how to do this or this or, you know, multiple modes of flams, it's the same thing as a double stroke roll, then flam accents become just something that now you can do and you just kind of have to know how it works, but you don't have to necessarily gain specific skill to do it. Flam taps, flam paradiddles, pataflaw flaws, flam accues, all of that stuff. So, you know, the last time I said the words lesson 25, referring to the rudiment called the lesson 25 in class, I mean, unless there was actually a lesson 25 lesson in the book, I don't know that I ever said anything too much about it. So that's my thought on all of that. And I now fully expect for a black van to pull outside of my house and <laughs> to have a hood put over my head and be abducted for a percussive heresy, but that's the way I approach it. Well, we might make it a little worse with this next question. <laughs> uh, how do we explain to our young students why we teach rudiments? Yeah, these are deeper waters now. Um, well, I will say this. Now, uh, the, one of the ways that you can explain rudiments to a place that's really applicable to a student is by them understanding that so much drumming predates the use of notation. So. Um, a lot of the drumming tradition that we have now comes from military background going hundreds of years back. So one of the things that you can say now, I, you know, especially when you um, introduce, I'm trying to, there's always like an early term that I use and I'm trying to remember what it would be. Uh, and I'll say the term and the kids will be like, oh, paradiddles, paradiddles. <laughs> because look, you know, you could play paradiddle sticking using full legato strokes. Um, so I'll say, okay, this is called a paradiddle and you'll have kids and they're like, that cannot possibly be what it's called. Like that doesn't sound like an official textbook term. <laughs> and I'll always say, well, I'm not making this up. Like this is how, this has been around for hundreds of years. A paradiddle is how drummers communicated what certain building blocks of the, of the, of drumming was without knowing necessarily how to read music or how to even write it down for those who did know how to how to read music. So you could tell somebody, oh, this pattern goes paradiddle, paradiddle, double paradiddle, double paradiddle, paradiddle, paradiddle. And if they kind of understood the verbiage of it, they could string those rudiments along. So I almost see rudiments as being important, um, not only from a playing perspective, because they are, I don't downplay that, but also like there's this great historicity to what we have as percussionists that's really unique to percussion that is not often found in other instruments. And so I always kind of talk about like, hey, I didn't make this stuff up, but isn't it cool that we still use these like antiquated terms because a flam just describes what the proper sound is. It's not like somebody sat down and wrote, and this will be called a flam. <laughs> they were describing how that sound should work to another percussionist. So yeah, I think it's important, but also I don't let it be, um, you know, the diet of what we do. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the lifeboat out so you don't can come out of those deep waters. Uh, okay, you gotta throw me a soft <laughs> throw me a softball here. Well, I don't know I don't know if it's a softball now, but this oh, okay. is, this is the last one I have for you. Okay, cool. All right, match grip, 
traditional grip or both? <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's a softball. I'll throw out the lifeboat. Now I'm going to completely throw you under the undertow. Um, okay. Match grip is what I teach. And I have zero problem with drum corps and colleges and awesome high school lines playing tra a traditional grip. I have no problem with that. My high school snare line played traditional grip. I love it. I love it because like we were talking about the, ru the rudiments, there's the tradition behind it. Um, I, don't, I don't see a lot of application to it with my students knowing traditional grip for a specific reason. Um, early on in my career, I rightfully just hung on every word I heard from Ken and Wiley at Marcus and the results speak for themselves. And um, he is in the middle of a lot of band programs that did maybe, and I don't know so much about what the Dallas Fort Worth traditional grip situation looks like now, but there was a time when I was first getting started that it was like really common for those high school lines to play traditional and he was a match grip guy. Well, his drum line sounded unbelievable. And so I thought, okay, if he's getting these kind of results, but he doesn't feel like he has to do traditional grip, maybe that's not something I need to wor like worry about too much. And what I found was, and I had a period of time where my drum lines played traditional just because you know, young and you feel like that's what you're supposed to do. I, re I realized that I lost so much time just teaching kids how to play traditional grip and then realizing, wait, if I only have four or five or six kids on the snare line and it's not a brand new group of four, five or six every year that there's retention, why am I teaching everybody traditional grip? I should just be teaching, I should just be teaching match grip. So that's, that's what I teach. Now, if a student ever says, hey, I would really like to learn traditional grip, I will sit down with them and we'll talk about the mechanics and I don't, I don't push that away. I'm not anti-traditional grip. Um, I, uh, I don't play a lot of drum set, but I do occasionally get called to sub at church and I will sometimes play traditional grip because I have a little bit of a jazz drum set background, a uh, bad jazz drum set background, but um, I got real comfortable with playing traditional. And so sometimes I'll do that at church and two things that not anybody, people don't often think about this, but when you play concert bass drum, if you have to roll, you want to use traditional grip on your left hand. So I actually do teach traditional grip because as a member of a symphony orchestra, I spend a lot of time behind bass drum and crash cymbals. And so I want to make sure accessory percussion is great in my bands. Um, but I will, like, if there's a reason to roll on bass drum uh, in a percussion section, it's like, stop. Okay, let's all learn how to roll on bass drum. And they learn, and I'll say, this is kind of a crude introduction to um, bass drum or traditional grip via the way of, of uh, bass drumming. The other way is um, if you want to get into four mallet playing, um, the Burton grip, which is a cross grip, I'm going to do this kind of awkwardly with sticks, which is a cross grip, you use on the, on the left hand, you use the inside mallet a lot for lead line, and that is a rot that's a rotating motion of the left hand, very much like traditional grip, and I remember I had just barely started learning Burton grip in college and I went and did uh, an audition for drum corps and they started to say, Hey, would you want to play vibraphone? You'll have to, you'll have to play Burton grip. And so I was demonstrating and they're like, Hey, have you played a lot of traditional grip? And I said, yeah, why? Cause I didn't feel like the two related to each other. And they're like, well, your right hand uh, independent strokes on vibraphone are similar to a match grip because you play with the outside mallet. And on the left hand, it's the inside mallet. Hmm. And that's literally the same set of motions on traditional grip. And so it was weird because it was like I had unknowingly been hard hardwired to play Burton grip really well because I was super comfortable with, um, with, the, with traditional grip. So I don't have a problem with it, but to me, it's just not, you know, I can't teach everything. So I have to pick and choose what's best for the development of the student. And um, how dare you not throw me that lifeline like you said you're going to, but oh. yeah, match, match grip all the way. 
I feel like if I say match grip all the way, the Percussive Arts Society will send me my membership back. Okay. And they'll be like, all right, you can, you can come back into the club. <laughs> well, this is a true softball. And if you don't hit this, I'll be mad at you. So okay. I know there are some questions about like, how do I incorporate uh, percussions into warm up and all this and that. Um, but I also know that you've written some fantastic material for percussionists uh, with the five minute drill, the nine minute drill. Can you talk a little bit about the things that you've come up with? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, and you're right. It's, that's a that's a great softball question with no controversy. Um, yeah, Ralph Hicks, who taught for a long time in the Houston area, taught in the Woodlands cluster. Um, he and I met by chance and found that we agreed on a lot of very fundamental developmental things, especially with what do you do with your second and third year percussionists because they get a lot of attention in sixth grade, and then they they can get kind of ignored in the second and third year of playing. And then when they get to high school, it's like, why aren't you a beast at percussion? You know, and it's like, well, because I'm playing, I don't know what you were going to play with your band this year, but I mean, even the most percussion heavy grade one, two, three pieces are not usually going to be super challenging for kids. So we started um, discussing that if we wanted our ensembles at the high school to be really strong, we needed to be doing something kind of backwards before that to prepare him for that. So we wrote a series, uh, we wrote a book called Beyond Basic Percussion. It's 10 different percussion ensembles. Each one focuses on a different either ensemble technique or instrument like accessory percussion. And it teaches students how to play in a percussion ensemble because um, playing in band is great and playing solo literature is great. But percussionists really gain a lot from chamber. I actually, I mean, I feel like musicians gain a lot from the chamber music experience. But percussionists for sure get a lot from playing in percussion ensemble where every part is a solo and you, man, you have to be responsible for that. And so it is not only a great way to keep them busy in grades seven and eight, but also to make them literate on a wide variety of instruments to, to gain confidence and independence in an ensemble setting. And then when they get to high school and you're trying to do really, really tricky ensemble stuff with them, it's like they have been built for that and then they just carry on, you know, to that really salty class one um, percussion ensemble literature. We, we were asked to do a, a clinic at TMEA in 2012. And at that clinic, we, we brought students from our schools and we showed off some of the things that we have our students do every day to develop their skills independent of the band warm up, And that eventually became the five minute drill. Our, our publishers were there and they said, hey, that looks like something that could be useful to people. So we developed the five minute drill. It's kind of like the, it's like what you do with your percussionist during the daily band drill, but separate so that it's more specific to what they need to do. And then that had been out for a while and people said, well, we love this, but do you have a harder version? So we said, yeah, we'll, we'll come up with a harder version. That's the nine minute drill. And I think it's safe to tell you about this project that we're working on now. Um, you'll be kind of the first one that's gotten to hear about it, but we're working now on a full band version of the five minute and the nine minute drill. Wow. Um, and part of the reason that we've had a lot of people ask for something, they'll, they'll say, I love the five minute drill. You know, it's just bite-sized chunks and it has play along tracks. When are you guys going to do something for full band? And we finally sat down and said, okay, we keep getting asked this. Maybe there's, maybe there's a reason to do it. So what we're doing is we've developed a lot of very um, basic, not basic, but like very universal um, exercises that work great from flute all the way down through auxiliary percussion three. They'll have play along tracks with them. There'll be simple things like, um, you know, like just learning major scales and then learning major scales and twice the speed. There will also be arpeggio studies. A lot of things, a lot of books do these things really well. So we're not necessarily trying to compete with it. But one of the things that's been missed is sometimes those books that teach our wind players really, really well, the percussion component is okay, but it could be better. And so the take that we're doing on it is, okay, so here's some great wind material. Now here's three different difficulties of snare drum. Here's a line for bass drum and crash cymbals. Here's tambourine and triangle. And it's actually teaching accessory percussion at the same time, it's reinforcing keyboard skills. And I love this. And I didn't come up with it, so I can say I love this. 
but there will be a two mallet version and a four mallet version for every exercise. And it's real four mallet stuff. It's not just block chords with apologies to a book that needs to go, you know, nameless. That was appropriate when that book came out. But the four mallet stuff really has like some light independence. It should be able to take a seventh grader with a little bit of guidance on how to hold the mallets. And during the daily drill, they can be sitting there on a marimba working on single independent strokes. And so suddenly we're giving a kid a chance to work on four mallet skills every day as just part of the daily drill. Uh, and everything will have a play along track to it too, because the play along track thing has been the coolest surprise out of ever. All of this is people just love play along tracks and I do too. So <laughs> yeah, that's, we're really excited. We don't even, um, we don't even know what that product's going to be called. In fact, uh, we were sent contracts on it and it was like unnamed, <laughs> unnamed project or whatever. It's like, oh, okay, cool. But yeah, I'm really excited for that to come out because it's just another way for percussionists to grow, but also to do that in the context of, you know, a lot of programs don't have a percussionist who can take students out. So providing ways for that to happen, we just feel like there's a real need for that and we're happy to provide that. Yeah. And so folks, if you, Eric, if people want to see um, you, your music, what is your website called? Oh, my website is um, ericrathmusic.com, but it's probably not the best place to see my stuff. Um, most of my percussion stuff, like 99% is at Tapspace, uh, tapspace.com. So if they want to see the products we've been talking about, they can go there and they can search for my name or they can search resources. And then um, I, you know, my, my website is just something where I have information parked there. It's not a, an ever evolving and fluid thing, but I do have a Facebook page. It's Eric Rath Music Texas, um, Facebook slash Eric Rath Music Texas, and they can find me there. And sometimes it's teaching materials and sometimes it's, you know, just kind of fun videos and things that I update pretty regularly, but that's a great way to get a hold of me too. And um, yeah, so there you go.